that's a word. All right, we're on. Okay, well, aloha to those entering the meeting, and we're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, if any of you are joining us in the meeting, we have your mic muted, but we will be using the Q&A feature to take your questions for our guests, so get ready to jot down those questions as we move through the presentation. And we'll also be recording today's presentation for all four HY media radio stations and on Facebook Live, and you can access a YouTube video after the event through maryreese.org. Okay, so I guess we're probably ready to get started here. Uh, aloha, everyone. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, and today we have another special joint collaboration with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Ocean Virtual Monthly Speaker Series and the public affairs show Island Environment 360, a full circle view of Hawaiian culture and environmental issues on Maui, brought to you as a community service of HY Media. And first off, um, mahalo Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for inviting me to host with you. MNMRC is a nonprofit organization working for healthy coral reefs, clean ocean water, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. And we have Ann and Meredith from MNMRC in the background running the show. And we're joined by two special guests, Alan Friedlander and Russell Sparks, who I'll introduce further in just a moment. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Roy, also known as the peacock uh, grouper, an invasive fish that was introduced to Hawaii in the 1950s. And the idea was they could provide some tasty food for people. Um, an aggressive predator that eats small reef fish, Roy, really flourished, especially when Hawaii residents found out that some of the fish carried ciguatoxin, cigu which is a type of food poisoning. And at that point, people pretty much didn't want to eat it anymore. <laughs> so um, with the, the alarm over the loss of reef fish and the concerns over the ciguatoxin, um, that it might spread up the food chain, communities throughout the main Hawaiian islands uh, organized some Roy Roundups um, to try and help with the, the issue. So today we're, we're gonna talk about some of that. We're gonna discuss how much of a problem is Roy and, um, maybe, and look at some scientific data as well. So our first guest is Alan Friedlander, currently the chief scientist for National Geographic's Pristine Seas Project, where he leads research efforts to understand and conserve the last wild places in the ocean. He's also the director of the Fisheries Ecology Research Lab at the University of Hawaii, where his major research areas of interest are coral reef community ecology, fishery science, marine conservation biology, and traditional marine resource use and management. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> also with us today, equally impressive, is Russell Sparks, the aquatic biologist at the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Aquatic Resources on Maui. Uh, Russell, you must have to have a really long business card for that, that title. Uh, Russell received his MS in Marine Biology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 1996. He's worked for the DNLR since 1998. And Russell, uh, is responsible for leading the design, implementation, and overall management of the Maui Marine Monitoring Program, and for working with stakeholders and communities to develop marine management programs aimed at adapting, managing nearshore fisheries and coral reef resources. Welcome, Alan and Russell. Alan, I'm gonna turn things over to you first. Uh, can you give us a background on Roy? Sure. Um, I'm going to jump right into this, everybody. Anyway, um, mahalo, everyone, for attending. It's, uh, it's always awkward to do these Zoom things where you can't see everyone, and this is a particularly strange time, but um, I'm happy to talk today. My lab, along with Russell and a lot of other people, have been working on Roy for a long time, and we know a lot about them. And I'm going to share some of that today. So hopefully everybody can see this. Um, this 
is Roy in its native habitat. This is actually Pitcairn Island um, in the South Pacific. Um, you can see Roy there flourishing with all, a bunch of other native groupers and, and other fishes. So they do occur naturally and coexist with a lot of other predators and prey species in their native habitats. And maybe for people that are just listening in, um, can you describe what they look like? I know now that I see them, I've seen them. <laughs> okay, so as Darla mentioned, they're also called the peacock grouper for obvious reasons. Those are the things right in the middle there with the blue spots and the white stripes on them. Um, it's a, you know, it's a grouper. Uh, moderate sized predator on a lot of reefs that are found throughout the Indo-Pacific ranging from French Polynesia all the way to the coast of West Africa. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to put this all in context before we get started about Roy and just talk about fishing in general in Hawaii. This is a, a Bill Walsh from the Division of Aquatic Resources shot some of this to me earlier today and it just reminded me of how we need to keep this all in context that um, fisheries resources in Hawaii have been on the decline for quite a while and even as early as the 1900s we've got records showing that um, nearshore fishes have been overfished overexploited and that continues on through the years so um, we're not starting from a recent problem we're starting from a, a fairly significant historical problem. And some of that's evident by the catch data that we have dating back to the early 1900s, which is kind of unprecedented for most places. And what we see is for many of the important resource fish that we know and love, like Alua and Oeo and Moi and so forth, uh, there's been up to a 90% decline in the catch and catch rates of many of these species over the last hundred years, which is well in advance or prior to the introduction of Roy and habitat destruction, a lot of other things we talk about now. Um, we do have recent evidence of overfishing around the archipelago. It's a paper we published a few years ago. Russell is also a co-author on this, so um, don't blame me exclusively. Um, what we did was we looked at the abundance of resource fish around the main Hawaiian Islands by Moku. And if you look at that figure there, you can see most of the places that have low resource fish biomass are places where we have lots of people, mainly around the island of Oahu, around east and south Maui. But we still have remote places in the main Hawaiian Islands, Ni'ihau, Hamakua Coast, uh, Molokai, so forth, Koholawe particularly that still harbor a lot of fish. So um, we have a mixed message, a mixed bag actually in Hawaii about resource fish. Um, but um, we have a significant problem with overfishing that extends back for at least the last hundred years. Okay, so the subject at hand, Roy. Um, a lot of fish were introduced into Hawaii early on. The biggest bolus of fish was probably in the 1950s. Um, this was a time during the Territorial Fish and Wildlife Agency where introducing fish all over the United States and other places was thought to be a good idea. Uh, the Marquesan sardine was brought in mainly for bait fish for the Aku fishery and some other things came in with that um, accidentally. The, non-native mullet, non-native flagtail, everybody's familiar with tilapia, gold spot herring. But the three main fish that people think about most when they think about successful introductions are Roy, the peacock grouper, uh, brought in from Morea, French Polynesia, into Oahu and the Big Island in the 50s with a couple thousand introductions. Tawau, Lujanus fulvis, um, also from Morea and Lugenis Kashmira Ta'ape. You'll notice that the names are the Tahitian names and they stuck with those um, as they were introduced to Hawaii. So these have been the most successful introductions. And Ta'ape by far has been the most successful of the three dominant ones. It extends all the way from the Big Island to Kure Atoll. Uh, Roy, or Cephalophus uh, Argus, goes from Big Island up to about Necker, Mokumanamana, and Lugenis fulvis, Tawau, uh, requires more estuary habitat. It's only found as far as Kauai at present. So we know a lot about Roy. We've been studying this animal for 
over a decade, and there's been a lot of research into that prior to that. But what we do know about them is they're long-lived and slow-growing. They matured in early age. They have a low natural mortality rate. They are ciguatoxic, so they possess fish poisoning. Uh, that makes them un, you know, undesirable, as Darwin mentioned. They're found at various depths all the way down, uh, all the way starting at tide poles down to 130 feet. And they're one of the dominant piscivores or fish eaters that we see on the reef. And I'm gonna briefly talk about each of these. So to give this a little more credibility, we actually have data behind this. And what we know from Roy, so fish have ear bones, you can age them like you can age trees. And what we find is that um, the oldest Roy that we see in Hawaii is about 25 years. That's slightly younger than they are found at their maximum age elsewhere, but you can see they grow very rapidly in their first couple years of growth. And then after that, they kind of um, keep plateauing along. They don't gain a lot of length, but they, uh, they do, they're fairly long lived, up to 25 years of age. They are ciguatoxic, so, um, but, Surprisingly, um, we, when we typically think about fish poisoning and other types of poisoning, it, they biomagnify. So what we think the larger animals typically have larger toxins in them or more, they're more toxic. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case in Roy. Of the 291 Roy that were examined from um, Oahu and the Big Island uh, a while back, about 46% of them showed up negative for Ciguatera. Uh, another 36% were marginal, and only 14% were positive, 18% um, as positive or strongly positive. So they are not all ciguatoxic, and it's not directly related to the size of the animal as well, which makes that a, kind of an enigma in, to some degree. So Ellen, uh, are there areas outside of Hawaii where they're not ciguatoxic at all? Right, so um, stigmatera poisoning is, um, it's a naturally occurring toxin and some places are hot spots and some places don't have stigmatera at all. So French Polynesia, for instance, uh, ha is notorious for having stigmatera poisoning and Roy is one of the culprits found there and they're not consumed as much there as other species. Places like Palau has no stigmatera poisoning at all and Roy are readily consumed there. How about Morea, where they came from? The Morea um, is a hotspot for toxicity, so they probably weren't consumed there as much as huh. other species. Interesting. Yeah, but you would have thought that they would have done their homework a little bit more <laughs> when they introduced it, but um, <laughs> anyway, that said. Um, so, what are the, um, these are data from Jan Durking, Bill Walsh, and others who did a pretty intensive a diet study, and this is from Hawaii Island. And what we can see is um, they eat mainly small fish. So we're not talking about big adult fish. We're talking about fish uh, 10 to 15 centimeters max that they're consuming and at, at the most, actually much smaller in most instances. But uh, the dominant fish in the stomach content were squirrel fish, about 25%, followed by surgeons, 13 uh, big eyes or a veil veil, parrotfish or uhu at about seven or eight uh, percent, butterfly fish, trumpets, and then files and triggers. So um, they kind of eat a mix of different species and nothing particular uh, comes out as being the dominant prey items for them. So I'm, I'm sure you're probably going to jump into this, but uh, from everything that they're eating, uh, does that impact the reef integrity? Well, I will get into that a little okay. bit later because it, um, as a, they're a piscivore, so they're a fish eater, as are many other fish that we see in Hawaii. So um, okay. I'll get into what the potential impact is. Thanks. Okay. Asking. That's a good tee up question. Um, so um, Roy changed sex. They start out life as females and they change sex. They will lead to males at about you know, 30, maybe um, 30 centimeters, 33 centimeters, something like that. But they reach sexual maturity uh, at a fairly small size at about 20 centimeters or a little more than a year in age. And then so they're, they're reproductive females at that particular point. 
they spawn year round, but the dominant spawning season is spring and summertime when the water's warmer, but they're lunar spawners. So they'll spawn around the first quarter and the fourth quarter of the moons. And those are things to keep in mind if any type of eradication or removal experiment um, or Roy Roundup was done because you want to maximize your efforts around times when Roy are reproductively active. Okay, um, they have a relatively low natural mortality rate. They're a medium-sized predator. Um, when we looked at age classes and the frequencies that are found in each age class, uh, you can do a little math, and from that you figure out that their mortality rate is about 14% per year, and that's, that's relatively low by standards of most reef fish, and, um, but pretty typical of this fish, and similar to what we see for their mortality rates in other parts of the world. Okay, these are some data from uh, DAR um, on the Big Island, and they track yellow tang over a long period of time, because uh, yellow tang is the most important fish in the aquarium fish fishery there, which has been, uh, you know, relatively no, strongly monitored in relatively well managed fishery over the last twenty some years. And what we see is, um, as a result of uh, in West Hawaii, where they've set aside a third of the areas to non-aquarium fish collecting, uh, yellow tang have increased during that time. Roy have um, kind of, they, they peaked a little bit in the early 2000s and then they declined after that and they increased a little bit. So their natural populations wax and wane, uh, just as other natural populations of fish do. Um, so you may see a lot someplace now and start to freak out, but um, these things tend to run their course. And what we can see here is there's no correlation between the abundance of yellow tang and Roy, which has been postulated by some people to uh, be a major predator on, on yellow tang. Uh -oh. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, I took those data that we, I showed previously around about the abundance of fish in mokus. Uh, so mokus are traditional uh, Hawaiian districts or, um, or areas, um, you know, larger resource areas and aupuas are nested within moku. Anyway, when we look at the abundance of roy across the state based on 20 some thousand surveys that we've done, we see actually a positive correlation between resource fish biomass, those are the fish we like to eat, and roy. Why is that? Um, places that have high fish biomass typically have quality, they are less fished overall, and therefore we see a positive relationship between roy and total fish biomass. So we don't see a negative effect in this case, we actually see a positive effect. Okay, so despite sorry, just just to be really clear, so you're saying that that Roy doesn't have an overall negative effect on the total biomass of all the fish species combined. That's right, and I'll get into the details a little okay. bit more from some of the experiments that we've done specifically with Roy. But this is just okay. kind of an overall about how sure. Roy correlate with fish biomass okay. elsewhere. Okay, so despite all this, um, there are concerns about Roy. Um, they are an invasive species that were introduced. Um, they are a predator on other fish. So people have been concerned. And as a result, as Darla mentioned early on, Roy roundups have uh, taken place uh, on many of the islands, uh, primarily on the Big Island, but also on Maui, Molokai, and Oahu as well. And uh, it's been a collaboration between scientists. Uh, you can see Eva Schimmel, one of my former students, Skippy Howe, D.A.R. Linda from D.A.R. as well as there. So it's been collaborative work um, with the community and resource managers and fishers and scientists working on trying to understand Roy better. And a lot of the data that we've collected and I've shown so far have been a, as a result of these collaborations uh, relative to these Roy Roundups. So Roy Roundups are, are legal to do in certain areas then? Maybe that's a question for Russell. That is definitely a question for Russell. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, well, certainly Roy fishing and harvesting is legal 
everywhere other than in areas where um, there are prohibitions against fishing. So some of our marine life conservation districts. So um, yeah, I mean, the Roy Roundups have been really successful and they've, they've um, in some cases targeted certain reefs where they wanted, the, the fishers wanted to like try and see if they could control the numbers. And other places, it was just all around the island and then you come in for a way and things of that sort. Yeah. Great, thanks Russell. Yep. So, um, as a result of all this, what we did is we collaborated with the Nature Conservancy and DAR on the Big Island over by Puaco to see if we could actually remove Roy from a treatment site and track the subsequent outcome of what happens to the fish community and the associated community after that. So what we did was um, we found some isolated patcheries over by Puaco. Um, they are, um, for people who have their screen, they've got, uh, it's about 1.3 hectares of, of reef habitat. And then we had a control area to the north that that was similar in size and also isolated with, with sandy areas around. And we picked those particular areas because they were isolated and because we could reduce the amount of roy that were immigrating uh, and emigrating to and from these treatment and control sites because they're isolated and have surrounded by sandy habitat. Okay, so the first thing you do is figure out how many roy you have there. And there's a couple different ways to do that. And none of them are straightforward and they give you different answers. So I wanna focus on this for a second because it's important if you're gonna try to do any type of removal experiment that you need to start off uh, with the right data. So one way that we did this was through tow board surveys. A diver is towed behind the boat. You do transects. You record the number of Roy in each of the areas that you see and you mark them down and you'll get a density estimate. Another way is typical scuba surveys where you just swim along, you count the number of Roy and other fish on the transects and then you get a density estimate that way. The third way is through a fishing down experiment where you, you look at the catch rates of Roy over a short period of time. So you go out and you fish hard one day, you fish the next day, so forth and so on. And the catch rates should be correlated with the abundance of animals out there. If, um, if you're fishing the same way every day, the catch rates should go down as the number of Roy goes down. And you can do a little math associated with that come up with what you think is the cumulative catch and the number of Roy out there um, after you've done that depletion experiment. Okay, you get different numbers. We actually removed 20.2 Roy per hectare. The depletion experiment gave us the most accurate estimate. It was an underestimate by about 13%. The tow boards dramatically underestimated the number of Roy by about 70%. Um, the boat is moving at, you know, a speed, the noise of the boat, you're moving quickly, you tend to undercount Roy. The transects in situ actually overestimated Roy. There's a, there's a lot of autocorrelation there, meaning that um, you're sampling the same Roy more than once when you're doing your surveys. So there's those three methods, by far the depletion method was the most accurate. And so if you're gonna do any type of experiment, um, that would be my recommendation to get the most accurate estimate of how many Roy you're starting with. We looked at immigration rates. So we caught 67 Roy using surround nets and we tagged them with little plastic tags. Um, for those people who have their screens there, they're the little red dots. And what we did was we tagged Roy up to 250 meters away from the treatment site. So remember, those fish are all removed from that treatment site. Um, and we had a modest amount of immigration into the area, but not, not a ton. A new Roy moved into the area about every six to seven weeks or so, uh, which is not a huge number. And, and what we found was we could have one diver fishing about every eight to 12 weeks to keep that reef clean of those new immigrants. How much does it cost? Um, depends who you're paying and um, what kind of expertise you want. At Puaco, um, 
the most effective way, but most costly way to do it was to actually have trained scuba divers who were spear fishers, trained boat captain, boat access, all those kind of good things that um, were excessive, but in the cost you about $2,300 per hectare to remove Roy. Conversely, if you have trained dive, oh, sorry. If you have trained divers and you are fishing from shore, you can do that for about a thousand bucks. Now, obviously, if you've got volunteers, it's much cheaper, it's virtually free, but you get what you pay for. You don't have as much of a controlled experiment. And if you're gonna do this properly, you really need to keep track of, you know, who, what, where, when, how, and why, if you're gonna get a good estimate of, of what the effects of this thing are going to be. And these are results of five years of Roy removal. So um, we had the control, we had the treatment site, and the overall uh, big picture is after five years, there's no effect on juvenile fish. These are fish smaller than 15 centimeters. Um, after the Roy were removed for about the first year and a half, we see a slight increase in the amount of small fish in the treatment area that didn't have Roy in them but you lose that after that period. And so as you extend off into about year four and year five, there's no significant difference between the control and the treatment site. So we don't see an effect on small fish and we see even less of an effect on the adult fish. There's, you know, fish, put out, yeah, fish put out a lot of larvae, right? You know, hundreds of thousands of, of keiki get, get put out um, by each individual fish. They do that for a reason because We've got a lot of surplus and most of that dies and so although Roy consume a lot of these new recruits that um, settle onto the reef a lot of them die naturally anyway so we don't hmm. see an effect after five years this was a very rigorous study that um, took a lot of time and energy to do interesting five years and really no no, no effect between the control and the treatment area yeah, that's, that's a big take home from, from that study. Uh, you can cut this a lot of different ways, but that's, that's really the overall message. But um, these Roy Roundups have been incredibly valuable. They're opportunities for scientists, resource managers, and fishers to collaborate, especially you know, in, in areas where people perceive Roy to be a problem. None of that life history information that we collected on reproduction, aging growth, diet would have been possible without the support of all these spear fishers and a lot of other people who um, devoted time and energy for free, devoted a lot of Roy for free to the process. So we, we've learned a lot over this time period. Um, and just to reiterate, um, it shares knowledge, it builds community and raises awareness for ocean stewardship. So there are some positive outcomes that um, can come out of these Roy roundups that, um, that can be very useful in the appropriate place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to talk about that. Um, so somebody asked a question about, um, you know, what is, what do Roy look like inside marine life conservation district, marine protected areas versus open areas? And right. what we see is that um, you have more Roy in marine protected areas than you do in their associated open access areas. And, and that's not s totally surprising. Um, you have overall abundance and size of fish are bigger in protected areas than in open. And people do kill Roy and people do eat Roy. So, and people do shoot Roy outside of protected areas just because they want to. So the, uh, we see significant differences in the abundance of Roy. They're much higher in abundance and biomass inside protected areas than outside. Okay. So to wrap it up, um, we see, you know, we've got historical problems with overfishing in Hawaii. So we have to be very careful about what those root causes are. A lot of people like to, um, you know, point at different things. It's Roy, it's Taape, um, it's pollution, uh, their habitat loss. Uh, a lot of those are true, but the overall thing is not one thing is causing the decline of near shore fish in Hawaii. Um, in the 1950s, uh, we thought it was a great idea to introduce a lot of fish to Hawaii and elsewhere around the U.S. and around the world. So um, 
that is water under the bridge at this point, and there's not much we can do about it, but um, I think we just need to recognize how they fit into the marine ecosystem in, in Hawaii. Um, they didn't really become overly abundant until the 90s, and we see their populations kind of waxing and waning in places around the state since that time. And the main thing that we've seen from our study over in Puka was they had a relatively small impact as a reef predator on the overall reef community. Okay. Uh, again, this is another picture of Roy in their native habitat. Um, this is uh, in the Southern Line Islands. Um, so they, they do, um, they have kind of an antagonistic behavior with one another, but I, I blew through that kind of fast, but I just wanted to give people a flavor for what's going on with Roy, and I'd like to, you know, focus more on what people's questions are, because sometimes these things raise more questions than they answer. You know, just since setting up on Roy to, to talk to you, um, I, I think that I've seen them scuba diving following behind eels. Why, does that sound right? And why would they do that? Right, so um, a lot of predators have kind of a, a commensal um, hunting behavior. You see this with uh, omilu and alua and eels. You see it with um, with veke and, and omilu where, um, I mean, in the case of veke, they're staring up the bottom and the omilu kind of charge in and try to take advantage of it. The same thing with the with the eels and, and the roy. They're, they're both predators. They're both trying to seek out the same thing. So there's, I don't know if they're they're thinking about it, but um, there's there's mutual benefit to their collaborative hunting. Okay, we did have a question come in from Jeff Bagshaw while you were speaking. It, it's a, a few slides back, but he asked, "Did the tagged immigration happen after the depletion?" So, uh, of course, that refers to your study area. Right. So the point was that after we removed all the roy from the treatment area, we tagged uh, 67 roy in the adjacent areas outside of that, and we wanted to see how many were going to immigrate into the area. So yeah, they, they, they were in theory all gone at that point. Okay. And um, Russell, I wanted to ask you, do you, do you know, is there any data um, do Roy or, or really, you know, other species, do they grow larger in the marine protected areas than outside the marine protected areas? Um, well, I, I, I doubt that they necessarily grow faster. Um, you see large Roy in open areas and you see large Roy in marine protected areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think to the effect, to the degree that there's been um, an effect of fishing on Roy over the last few years with the Roy roundups and with kill Roy days and, and concerted efforts from local spear fishers to target them, that the large ones get removed relatively quickly <clears throat> from the open areas. But because that's not happening within the reserves, you still see some of the larger adults there, um, probably in more abundance than you see them in the open areas. But, but um, you know, I think, as Alan mentioned earlier, the association is pretty clear that where there's more fish, there's more roy. And they're all kind of in those areas because they're good habitats. Perhaps there's a lot of productivity in those areas for them to feed on. Um, so, so certainly in areas where there's a lot of fish, you see roy, whether it's in marine reserves or not. And um, the roy tend to be quite large if it's a productive area with a lot of good habitat and a lot of fish. Okay, so we got a question in from Chad Wiggins. Uh, it says, thanks Dr. Friedlander. Was there evidence of ciguatera in Hawaii prior to the introduction of the species from elsewhere in the 1950s and 60s? <laughs> I, there had been a little bit of ciguatera research done in Hawaii prior to that. So as I mentioned mm -hmm. previously, ciguatera is a naturally occurring um, bacteria, dino, make a dinoflagellate, but it usually gets stirred up and, um, and their populations proliferate in places that are disturbed. So there's probably a correlation between um, increased human population, increased shoreline development, uh, disturbance of habitats in Hawaii, which probably occurred around that same time, 
uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So it's hard to decouple those from right. one another. So in other words, um, you know, you, you, you dredge up um, Mauna Loa Bay or, you, you know, you armor shorelines, you introduce pollutants into the environment, and that naturally occurring toxins going to proliferate more and accumulate through the food chain. So, in fact, Roy um, is a predator, and so they will get ciguatera. But, you know, eels have very likely been ciguatoxic in the past. But I think, in general, things tend to be more ciguatoxic now than they were. And they're really, and the work that had done on, on Roy that showed the highest concentrations were typically around Oahu and some parts of the Big Island that had more human disturbance. Okay. Um, Catherine Thunholm asks, did he say they are edible in Hawaii? She might, she might have come in a little late, but we could go over that again. Sure. Um, I mean, there are people who definitely go out there and eat Roy. Uh, some people uh, feel that there are certain places that have lower incidence or no incidence of ciguatera than other places, so they, they take the risk. And as I showed, it was only about 18% of the ROI that showed up as ciguatoxic. So it's a bit of a gamble, but, um, and people, you know, people eat a lot of reef fish in Hawaii and elsewhere that have the potential for, for ciguatera. Kole has, has ciguatera in, in parts of Hawaii, but it doesn't stop people from eating it. Um, so yes, people do eat, um, people do eat ROI. Okay. You know, um, I came across something else in some research. Uh, in your opinion, is it a valid theory that we fish are more susceptible to Roy because it's introduced as opposed to other predators like Alua? Okay, I get all these questions instead of Russell, but Russell, feel free to chime <laughs> in. Um, <laughs> um, so jump in, jump in here, Russell. <laughs> The reason that um, Roy and they, they brought in uh, about 20 species of snappers and groupers from the South Pacific. And the reason they did that is because we have very few native snappers and groupers in Hawaii. And that's not because of overfishing. That's just because of isolation and biogeography. Hawaii is just weird. Uh, Hawaii has a lot of species found nowhere else on earth, but it has a lot of species that are found in a lot of other places that aren't found in Hawaii and the groupers and snappers fall into that category. So <laughs> they thought, well, we're gonna bring in a bunch of groupers and snappers. Um, most of them did not become established. Only those three, Tawau, Ka'ape and Roy have really um, had an impact. And so it's, uh, where was I going with this? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Lost my train of thought on that one. Oh, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying about um, naivete. Um, so we don't have a lot of uh, bottom predators. Eels were pro are, are probably one of the most abundant uh, bottom predators that we see in the main Hawaiian Islands. So these prey species are, are, weren't totally naive to having those type of predators around. They were naive to Roy, so they may have been more susceptible but based on the data, it doesn't appear that um, it's had a big impact on the populations of them. But yeah, it does make some sense that they, this is an unknown predator to them, so they may be uh, more naive. Okay. Hey, Geraldo Farrington wants to look at the graph again of the fish abundance after the Puakau removal experiment. He says, I thought the air bars showed a slight significant difference and the trend seemed to increase with time. Okay. Uh, right. So um, what we saw was, I have, I have another figure, but we saw is about a year and a half after the removal, so the removal is a, a vertical um, gray line for those people who have a screen here, which happened uh, in early 2011. And for about a year and a half, we see some little bit of difference between the two. But remember, we're, we're looking at the difference between the control and the treatment. That's why you want a control site always, because you can have increased recruitment of these small fish 
in areas um, that are totally unrelated to either the removal or presence of, of Roy. And so um, the overall effect is, is non-significant over the course of the entire study. So okay. Alan, I think what he's talking about is when you get out to May 2015, mm -hmm. uh, it looks like they're spaced out again. Is that just right. not significant when you do the statistics on it or? Right. Actually, there's another, I ended up taking Bill Walsh's figure from this. There's another time period that I have on, on another figure. There was one more round after that, that it kind of tightens up a little bit. But remember, um, yeah, you're not looking at each of these rounds independently. It's, it's a trend over, over time and the trend over time is, is not significant. <laughs> We, we have an anonymous attendee that's, that's paying really good attention because um, they noticed you skipped a slide at the end. And I think that was the one we were gonna add in that showed where Roy are found around Maui. <laughs> wow, they got that one because that was, yeah. a, total, that was a total drive-by. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, this is one of my former PhD student, Jonathan Giddens work where she modeled um, Roy habitat preference. And basically, there's a couple of drivers that dictate where Roy are found and what's their preferred habitat. Uh, they, they prefer relatively shallow habitat. They prefer habitat with high coral cover. And slope of slope is just a measure of how complex the habitat. They like these complex habitats with a lot of puka because that's their ambush predators. So that's where they like to, like to hang out. And um, when we modeled that over the state, I focused just on, on Maui in this particular case um, to get better resolution. And the red spots that you would see on the map are places where you would predict high Roy abundance to be. And not surprisingly, there's, those are the places where people tend to see a lot of, of Roy. You know, Ma'alaya, Kihei area down by Ahi'i Canal are also areas where we would predict based on the models that we would have high Roy abundance. Okay. Uh, Chad Wiggins wants to know if either one of you have seen a giant grouper in Hawaii or anywhere else. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Epinephalus lanceolatus, the giant grouper, is an amazing animal. They are bigger than you when you're in the water if you really get the opportunity to see one. One was caught off the big island uh, a number of years back, I remember. Mm -hmm. They are probably an incidental species in, in Hawaii. They, in other words, um, they may have individuals that um, get swept over here, but they don't seem to have a persistent uh, high abundance. And in most other places around the world, they're usually gone only in large protected areas or a lot of the remote areas that I get to work in with my day job with National Geographic have I had the opportunity to see giant grouper. Okay. There was there was one caught by some Ulua shore fishermen in McKenna. Um, I believe it was probably in the, the early to mid 80s. I think I was in high school at the time. And you know it was a big big deal. It was like several hundred pounds, they put it on a flatbed truck and they paraded it in the Makawal Parade for wow. 4th of July. So it was around this time. They're, they're, they're amazing animals. They're actually, they're very, very huge, no doubt. So, huh. uh, so Susan uh, posted a comment on Facebook asking if uh, you, during the roundups or during the research study, if, if you did any test for the toxins? Um, we didn't during that, but a lot of the, um, it, it was um, Paul Bienfang, who is at the Department of Oceanography over at the University of Hawaii, was doing a lot of the Secretary of Research at the time. And we were using a lot of the ROI from the ROI roundups to, for the Secretary tests. And that was a way to get, get a lot of ROI. Uh, so, someone from Facebook says, sorry if I missed it, but do you know what reef fish they typically prey on the most? And we did have a graphic on that. 
don't know if that's something we can. Right, I can throw that up again. Um, I remember also, parrotfish, number one. <laughs> uh, no, actually, um, the data that I showed before, uh, oh. that, that I shared with you previously in the previous um, version of this was from and these are some data from Hawaii Island. So it, it depends, right? Um, they have different feeding preferences depending on where you are. And this is actually okay. the, the percentage of the number of fish, which seems more appropriate than the I figure see. that I shared with you before, which was the weight of fish, because they may eat a few decent sized parrotfish, which skews that. But when you're looking at the kinky, when you're looking at the new recruits, looking at the number of individuals is probably a more relevant and important statistic. So, um, so you, you, you tricked me, Alan. No, just there's I, not one answer. That's the I, thing, I thought, you know? I, I thought I had that data memorized. <laughs> the the um, other thing to, to point out, because I know a lot of people did, um, were concerned about the amount of parrotfish found in their diet with this Durkin study, <clears throat> is that, you know, they're feeding on, on recruits, right? So they're so when they're talking about parrotfish, they're talking about those small, gray, mostly Psittacus, maybe you know the you know the pale nose, um, and and the bullet oh, yeah. bullet head parrotfish that are really abundant on on reefs, and you'll see those things in relatively large schools when they recruit out. Um, they're not feeding on you know large parrotfish that fishermen are, are targeting so much, right? And again, it's that kind of um, abundance of biomass that, you know, lots and lots and lots of recruits, if they weren't being fed on by the, by the predators and they were surviving at some point, the, the habit, the, the ecosystem would not be able to support them, right? They'd just be too much and there'd be some mortality that occurs from starvation and other things. So predators are playing a really important role um, in kind of culling that out, eating the, the sicker ones, the, the, the ones that are not quite as smart as avoiding their behavior and whatnot and driving mm -hmm. kind of some of those adaptive changes over time to help make all of these fish more um, productive and, and, and do better on the reef and improve the overall ecosystem. So, so I, just, I just want to point that out because predation is, is really, really important on coral reefs. And, you, uh, you actually just answered a, a question uh, from a, an anonymous attendee pointing out that um, uh, Roy might have a positive role as a, as a predator. So thank you for already answering that. Um, there's an interesting question from Brian Delamer. He's asking, is there a test I can do for ciguatera on the fish I shoot? An old rumor is to let the fish out in the fresh air. If flies gather, it's okay. But if flies avoid it, that fish is bad. But that's not the way I would like to test my fish to eat. There's a lot of old wise tales about how to see if fish were ciguatoxic. Put a put a penny in there, and if it turns green, you know it's ciguatoxic. Um, uh, people used to catch mongoose and feed the um, feed the fish potentially that were ciguatoxic to the mongoose. If they come back the next day and the mongoose is dead, then don't eat the fish. Um, there was a ciguatera test kit that uh, the state was producing, it was a commercial production for a while. There's a little dipstick that went in and it just it proved to be not very accurate. And I think they discontinued that a while back. Uh, Russell, correct me on that one. The more sophisticated tests that they were doing at the university would be much too cost effective to, I mean, costly to uh, be able to have it practically used by spear fishers. Okay. Um, you know, kind of related but, to that, if there is an event, um, would you like people from the event to collaborate on testing? Go ahead, well, Russell, I, talk I, about I, the test in. kits. Yeah, no, I mean, it, the test kits were readily available, and, and like my understanding was that there was a lot of false positives, or that they were really sensitive to residual amounts of, of toxin in the fish, amounts that I guess most fish have at some level anyway. So, so you were, you were assuming they were positive and throwing away a lot of potentially good fish uh, that you could have eaten. And um, 
that was the biggest problem perhaps, but I, I may not be completely correct on that. I do know though that we don't, we no longer see them in fishing stores and available yeah. for purchase. Um, sure. But, but yeah, and the, you know, when, when these um, big Roy, kill Roy events were going on, we, we did, um, co you know, collaborate with them, collect fish, collect data as Alan pointed out. And, and I do believe some of it was donated to the university for them to um, look at and try to extract some of the toxin and, and work and use to, to try to come up with better kits and better, better diagnostic means of, of looking at cyclotoxin. I, I really apologize. I don't know where that stands right now, but, but certainly um, we could look into it if there were going to be big events again and, and look at whether or not collecting the fish and donating them to the university uh, would be useful for that. Okay. Program. Sounds good. Hey, we've got one last question. Roy, are you, oh, I'm sorry. This is from Geraldo Farrington. Roy are easily noticed, but isn't the biomass of that top a much greater and perhaps more influential? Um, so another fish that we worked on um, a while back, I did a lot of work up in Kauai on, on Ta'ape. The, one of the speculations was that um, Ta'ape compete for habitat space. They form daytime resting schools, similar to way Veke do uh, on the reef edge. So there's some potential competition for habitat. Um, they are preying on shrimp and crabs in the sand at night for the most part. Did a lot of swimming around in the sand at night and catching them. Um, but there's a lot of shrimp and crabs out there. I wouldn't worry about depleting the populations of those things. But um, they get caught in the bottom fish fishery and I'm sure it is um, none too pleasing to the guys who are trying to fish for bottom fish to have Ta'ape steal their bait and, and come up. But the, unlike Roy, Ta'ape is a perfectly good eating fish. Um, they do mass in large numbers in, in certain places. Um, and their populations have seemed to also wax and wane um, in some places where they were heavily abundant before and aren't as abundant now. But yeah, I mean, they have a lot of biomass, um, but they are totally edible and very good fish. It's just not something that people historically in Hawaii were used to. Uh, if you go to Samoa or places in the South Pacific where Ta'ape are common, uh, people love them. Okay. You, you know, we are going to wrap up the questions, but there is one that, that came in actually there's a couple of things and i'm i'm going to answer one of them but uh <laughs> so another anonymous attendee says do you think encouraging kill roy events might be giving fishers the wrong impression that roy are primarily responsible for declines in Hawaii reef fishes and not other factors such as habitat loss and overfishing so i know we we covered that and the data was showing that you know it, it overall really wasn't a negative effect, but in your answer, could you also maybe talk about what, what can we do about habitat loss and, you know, help better protect the reef? I, I might give, give Alan a, a slight break here and, and, and try to try to take that, Darla. Um, first off, I would say I, I agree with the concern expressed and, and the department and the division, you know, has a similar concern. Um, and that oftentimes people are, are reaching for something that they can do. You know, it's so overwhelming to see fish populations declining and habitats declining and so forth. And you want to do something to contribute to, to make it less bad, right? <clears throat> and so a lot of fishermen have kind of glopped onto this, this idea of uh, eliminating Roy help enhance fish stocks. And, and the reality is that, you know, it's not likely to make much difference. And that's what the data Alan talked about um, pointed out. And in fact, because of this long history of, of depleting fish numbers and, and having heavy fish pressure having an effect, particularly on a lot of our predators or natural predators like the omilus, the eels and the things that are, are you know, hunting uluas and so forth, hunting on that shallow reef, Roy may be pro providing actually a very critical predation pressure to help you know, improve the overall ecosystem. 
We don't know that for a fact. It's really hard to tease all these things apart. Um, but we do know that a lot of these natural predators are, are greatly reduced from what they um, are in areas where fishing is not allowed or in other pristine areas like the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And, and there was one thing that I saw that um, Dr. Walsh shared with Alan and I earlier today that was interesting where I looked at the actual uh, percentage of the fish's size that they eat and prey fish over the course of a year. And I think Roy was something like two and a half times the size of it itself. So over the course of an entire year, Roy will eat two and a half times its body mass in other fish. Whereas Omilu was like 10 times higher. Do you remember, Alan, what it was? Yeah, it was, about, like it was about more than 10 times higher the amount of prey that Omilu consumed relative to right. Roy. Okay, so you can imagine Omilu, something that's high, highly targeted and, and depleted substantially from what it is in pristine areas, has a huge effect. Um, and if there's more of them around, like there would be when, if there wasn't a lot of fishing pressure over the years, that's substantial in, in kind of, you know, driving predation pressure and, and the ecosystem. And so without having that, having more things like Roy around could be really important. And again, I say could because it's just, it, you know, we don't know all of these little intricacies um, for certainty. But that does provide caution from a resource management point of view, right? And so that's why... Um, we don't discourage people from going out and hunting them. Uh, we just, at this point, we're not opening up, you know, marine reserves that are under the control of the Division of Aquatic Resources for uh, taking out Roy. We would rather those places just find some equilibrium and balance out and be areas that we can study and see how things are going. You know, we're, we're out of time, but I, I just wanted to put out to both of you um, very, uh, knowledgeable gentlemen that, you know, there, there are a lot of people through these questions that are kind of coming in at the last minute that, you know, they, they want to know what they can do to support the marine ecosystem and some are coming in from fishermen. So, you know, maybe that's a topic, you know, for another whole show, you know, how can we all, you know, divers, fishermen, everyone else, how can we work to you know, better support the reef, see more uh, fish come back, um, reduce decline. I'm just going to leave it there because, uh, like I said, we're we're out of time. But um, really wanted to thank you both so much uh, for it, this was so informative. Um, also, people were asking where they can see the information that was presented, and they they can. We're going to talk about that in our our wrap up here. So uh, just first, I wanted to mention that coming up August 5th is another free Zoom webinar offered by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. And the guest presenter will be uh, Kaika Santana, a PhD candidate at Stanford University who will be sharing details on a study she did of Maui beach goers before COVID-19 to learn about their views of the, their role in protecting coral reefs. So kind of, kind of what we were just talking about a little bit. Uh, to receive free information about this and future events, please visit MauiReefs.org and sign up for the free Reef and Brief e-newsletter or follow m and RC on Facebook. And again, special thanks to presenters Russell Sparks and Alan Freelander. Mahalo to the County of Maui Economic Development Office for supporting Know Your Ocean virtual monthly speaker series. And you'll be able to view this webinar uh, again uh, on Facebook. You know, it's on Facebook Live, but then it'll be on Facebook, uh, Akaku Maui Community Media. And uh, you can listen this Sunday on the radio on Kony 104.7, KROC 97.3, KRYL Country 106.5, and Retro 102.1 on Maui, Sunday at 9 a.m. Thank you for attending. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council works for healthy coral reefs and clean ocean water and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui County. You can learn more at MauiReefs.org. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson uh, and from Island Environment 360. Let's keep the conversation going. Together, we can work towards solutions. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks.